Start recording. Okay, so the meeting will also be recorded. So if you want to listen to the whole meeting, you can do that as well, or you can just go to the story map and kind of scan up and down. We have a few folks that are also in satellite offices in Montpelier and then also in St. Johnsbury. As you see, we work with the conservation districts. We also work with the regional planning commissions, Jess Richter's here from Two Rivers. And I was hoping that we could go around the room and everybody could just introduce themselves and just say sort of what their interest is or their connection is to the plan. So I'm Danielle Zarski, I'm the Basin Planner and I write the plans and hopefully coordinate with people in the communities to get actions done in the plans. And um, I'm Jennifer Byrne, the District Manager of the White River Natural Resources Conservation District. Um, we cover um, uh, basically almost all of Orange County uh, and a little bit of Winter County. Oh, and sorry, if you could speak up, we have a mic you oh, can use if you yeah. want, just so people online can hear as well. But if you talk loudly, they should be able to hear you. So first row. Gary Moore Bradford. I'm Michael Thomas, I'm with the Midland Conservation Commission. We were involved in the beginning of the Basin 14 many years ago, uh, when we first started in this area, in our Conservation Commission, and we worked with the towns of Rimey, Rotten, and Peachum. As they don't have Conservation Commissions, we kind of spearheaded the meetings for the Wells River Basin. Thanks. I'm Jess Richter with the Two Things Daniel Hood said with uh, Two Rivers. Um, our region covers 30 towns in East Central Vermont, um, a significant portion of which um, Basin 14 is in. Um, so we work with uh, Danielle and the state um, to provide comments to them on these plans, um, assist with the planning process as we can, as well as implementing the projects that are identified in these plans. Ron Rhodes. I'm wearing two hats tonight. Uh, one is a volunteer board member for Greater Upper Valley Chapter of Trout Unlimited. And then my job is with the Connecticut River Conservancy. We do restoration work here in Basin 14 and all up and down the river. Hi, my name is Greg Allen from Lake Maury. Do you include uh, milk oil control and lake and stream sampling chemistry? This is Nikolai, White River Conservation District. And our Trees for Streams specialist, if anyone's interested in Trees for Streams. Hi, I'm Ann Stevens from the West Bend Conservation Commission. Normally Peggy would be here, but her mother's in the hospital with a stone, so I'm kind of replacing her. And then we also have Andrew, who's who's manning the door right now um, to let people in. He's also from the White River Conservation District. Uh, on the phone, we have Frank Maloney from the Northeastern Vermont Development Association, the Regional Planning Commission in the northern part of Basin 14, uh, Pam D'Andrea from the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, and Kathy Ufer, also from Connecticut River Conservancy. And Frank, I'm just going to unmute you to see if you have any other folks with you. Go ahead. Okay, Carrie, you want to go ahead? Uh, this is Carrie O'Brien with the Caledonia County Conservation District. Uh, I cover the northern part of the basin, uh, the Stevens, and part of the Wells River. Brent Smith, I'm from Groton, and uh, I'm on the uh, uh, NBDA um, review board here. Jim Brown, Water Quality Advisory Committee here, working with Frank and NBDA in St. Johnsbury. That's it. That's us. <clears throat> okay. Thanks, Frank. I'm going to mute you again. Okay, Pam, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead. Okay, hi, this is Pam D'Andrea, Water Quality Planner at Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. And we do um, quite a lot of assistance with the basin planning and outreach and helping develop those plans. 
And the communities that we have included in this watershed are Orange and Washington. Those are the two towns. And with me, I have one of my coworkers, Grace, go ahead, you can announce yourself. Hi, this is Grace Vinson. I'm a planner at CVRPC. And we have one guest with us tonight. Yes, somebody came. Thank you. Go ahead, Ira. I'm, uh, I'm Ira Shadis. I'm the stewardship coordinator with Friends of the Mad River and I work on a bunch of uh, projects that are not directly related, but of a, a similar uh, uh, style to this. Can you hear Ira okay? Yes. Thank you, Ira. That's it. That's who's here. All right, thanks. I'm going to mute you now. Okay. All right. So everybody who's either on the phone or here has been in, sounds like has been involved with the basin plan in the past. Gary, I don't know if you've gone to the other basin plan meetings for 14 in the past. So it sounds like you're all relatively familiar with the process. So tonight I'm going to go over the, pro the basin planning process just to kind of reintroduce everybody give you some information about some things that have changed, a bunch of the projects, go over some of the projects that's happened in the basin, and then what our sort of priorities are, a sneak peek at some of our priorities in terms of restoration and protection. And then I'm hoping that I can get some feedback from you all on sort of your expectations, how you'd like to be involved in the process, any recommendations of things that you'd like to see in the plan. I want to make sure that you get out of this um, what you want to um, because you've taken the time to come here. And this will also be available, this presentation will be available online so you can access the presentation on the Basin 14 webpage. If you search Basin 14 Vermont on Google, it'll take you right there. This presentation is also being recorded, so if you want to listen to the webinar, you can listen to the webinar as well. And then I will also have the comments posted on the website. There'll be a survey connected to this, so if you have things that you want to comment on later, you can just go into the survey. The survey, it's really quick. You just kind of enter your information and then put in your comments. So that makes sure that I get that information. And then, of course, you can always email me. If you want to have meetings in your town for your conservation commission or the groups that you're working with, you can request that as well. I'm more than happy to come on out and discuss things that are more specific to your town. All right, so what's going on in your, in your watershed? This is a five-year update for the Stevens Wells, Waits, on Pompanoosuk, and Connect, Connecticut Direct tributaries for the Tactical Basin Plan. I want to start out with the basics, which I'm sure you're all aware of, but I think it's important to touch base. Um, the terms watershed and basin can be used interchangeably, so you'll find that I use watershed and basin in this presentation, but they basically mean the same thing. So watershed, is a, uh, watershed or basin is an area of land where precipitation collects and drains off into a common outlet, such, a, such as into a river or a lake. The drainage basin includes all surface water from runoff, snowmelt, nearby streams that run downslope towards that shared outlet. And basins combine with other basins to form a network of rivers and streams that progressively drain into larger water areas. So you can have, your, your driveway could have a watershed connected to it if you have a little stream rivulet coming down. Um, the, a lake has a watershed connected to it. The Connecticut River has a watershed. The Long Island Sound has an even larger watershed. So you can see how these can be divided up. And the reason why we use watersheds is if we are dealing with a specific pollutant within a stream, we can say, this is where we're seeing the pollution problem. If we can draw the watershed around looking at where all the water's coming from and coming to that point, it can help us to determine where we should be focusing our efforts and, and identifying the pollution. We wouldn't be looking outside of the watershed to identify where that pollution's coming from. So it can be helpful for planning. And what is a tactical basin plan? So the state of Vermont created 15 watershed management units. So this has changed over time. I don't know if in the last basin plan there was a basin 16 as well, but now the way that it's done is that basin 16 is generally north of where basin 14, and then we've combined those direct tributaries. So all the direct tributaries to basin 14 from the middle of Vermont north were part of that basin 16. So now we've joined some of those. So you can see right here, we are part of all those direct tributaries. So those number 16s in this area are now part of 14. And then you can see the upper Connecticut 
from this point on, which I think is Sutton Brook, where Sutton Brook comes into Barnet. So that this point is the last watershed that comes into Basin 14 to the north, and everything north of there is the Upper Connecticut. So each of these units is managed in part by a basin planner, and each basin planner manages and creates a tactical basin plan for three watersheds on a staggered schedule every five years. So that gives you an idea of my ability to know everything about these three watersheds that are all over 500 square miles. So they're quite large. So generally, working with partners and local people is how I find out what's happening in the watershed and then taking information that comes from our divisions of water quality information that they collect. So I don't know everything about every basin and I don't have an encyclopedic brain either. So I might not be able to answer all your questions. Um, but I can generally find answers. So during the five-year cycle, state staff and watershed partners collect information to track and determine the condition of the state's surface waters. The basin planners work with state and federal staff, municipalities, regional planning commissions, natural resource conservation districts, and watershed groups. And these aren't the only people we work with, as you know. Um, to develop strategies to address water quality priorities that are identified through water quality monitoring and assessment activities. So in general, we want to know that, there, that we have evidence that something's going on in those areas before we spend a lot of resources on them. So up, up you see this like nice little circle image where we have monitoring. So the state does their own monitoring. And then they develop these assessment reports based on the monitoring data that they find. And so they do these rotations every five years. And then we start writing the plan based on what's the new information we found since the last basin plan. And we look for public input to help us develop our strategies. Then once we do that, we kind of have a plan that we work on to finalize and put that plan into action. And during these five years, people are continuously working on projects. And so this is just kind of like a reboot, kind of to check in with everybody, see where they're at, and then see where our holes are, where our gaps, you know, what do we need to do? And then to reconnect with people that we might have lost connection with as well. So this is one of our volunteer monitors in the Caledonia Conservation District, Carrie O'Brien, who you um, heard on the phone earlier. So the strategies for protection and restoration of surface waters are carried out by implementing projects, initiatives, and regulations that protect and restore surface waters of um, rivers, lakes, and wetlands. So there's all different ways that we try to meet the goals that we have set for water quality in our basins. So at its core, a tactical basin plan is an instruction booklet to achieve watershed health that we try to look at every five years and get an update of where we're at. So why are tactical basin plans important? Um, I chose to really focus on the funding aspects of things here, but there are many reasons why these plans are important. And I think mostly because they help support communities to do the work that they need to do to continue to protect their surface waters. Um, it's also required. So the Vermont Water Quality Standards, as well as Vermont's Clean Water Act, require the development of tactical basin plans for each of Vermont's 15 river basins to be adopted every five years. And during the tactical basin planning process, a list of um, priority actions are identified for state clean water funding. So there are lots of different sources for funding, but one of the sources that I can be helpful with is the state funding. It doesn't mean I can't help folks identify other sources of funding, but this is the one that I'm most closely linked to and know the most about. And any of you have worked with grant funding organizations, things can change, and especially the state, it's always changing. I mean, will continue to change right now. So the project identification process helps us to prioritize where funding should be focused. So one of the things that's good about the plans is we can um, say in the plan, this is an important project that we should work on or that we should be working on and dedicating money to, and you can use that to get funding if it's been identified in the plan. The other thing I'd like to say is if it hasn't been identified in the plan, we also have a database that we can put projects into. So if something comes up after the plan is written and we consider that it's still a high priority, we can still get it into the process. So it doesn't necessarily have to be in the plan. Um, there's other ways that we can get priorities. 
done. All right. So the graph graphic you're looking at here shows the funding from 2000 fiscal year 2016 to 2018 by major basin. So this is from the investment reports in an annual investment report. One will be coming out in June, uh, January 2019 or 2020, and it will have information from 2019. So that funding information. And this report will actually have a short two-pager, three-pager on the funding that was specific for Basin 14 and then any of the other basins if you're interested in that. And so as you can see, um, this is our pie chart here that over $28 million was dedicated in those two years to the Connecticut River Basin. So that's this whole area here. And that a large portion of that was to wastewater projects. So the projects in the plan can also be highlighted when applying for other state, nonprofit, and federal funding sources. So VTRANS, if you're, you know, road foremen who are applying for funding to do road projects, can use the Tactical Basin Plan as a place to say this has been identified in the plan, so it's a priority. And generally, you might get a couple extra points um, on your scoring. So what's new for tactical basin planning? We have the Clean Water Projects Explorer. So this is trying to be a little bit more friendly for people to help them understand where projects are actually taking place in their basin. So anybody can utilize this tool. And I'll, kind of, I'll show you. So if you want to use this online, you can um, look at this presentation, or you can just search it and find it. So we'll take a tour. So you want to start by choosing any project you want to search for. And you can hover over these buttons and it'll tell you what each one means. So potential projects are projects that haven't been completed, but maybe they've been identified in like a stream geomorphic assessment, um, sometimes in road erosion inventories or culvert assessments. And then we have projects in progress. So that means they've been funded. These are projects that have been funded. And then the completed projects, those are projects that are complete. I want to be clear that not every project that's done for clean water around the state probably gets into this. There's probably a lot of stuff that people are doing locally that don't necessarily end up with this. It's generally where clean water funding, whether it's federal or state, is used for those projects. And the state is grabbing all that information and trying to track it. So if you want to see your projects on this list, then you can let me know, you can let the regional planning commissions know, or the conservation districts, and we can make sure that they get into here, if that's something that you're interested in. So you can pick, we're looking at projects in progress, then you can add a search parameter. So sector is just your project type, so it could be agriculture, stormwater, a river project. Um, generally, step isn't something you might be interested in. Um, your county, your town, you're probably interested. If you want to see all the projects that are in your town, you can just search your town. Um, one thing I will admit, because this, uh, because this basin is in the process right now, there are not a lot of like new potential projects in there. So I'll hopefully, if I'm lucky, have an intern working with me um, once the plan, probably sometime in June, and we'll be able to start putting all the priority projects into the database. So if you have projects that you're like, this is a priority, we talk about it, we can probably put them in the database. So in this case, they pick Windsor County, you click the search button, and then you get these map results. So you get a symbol showing where each individual project is on the map. And there's a map key that you can click that tells you what the different colors mean. And then you have this results is spelled wrong. I've asked our database manager to fix that, but he's really busy apparently. Um, and there you can search this list here. So you just click it. So one thing to notice is that it says projects found 98. And it also says projects with map points found 13. So in general, not all the projects have locations associated with them. In some cases, especially for agriculture, it's a privacy issue. So they're not allowed to actually share those locations. Uh, in general, sometimes you have projects that span multiple areas or um, focus on a larger um, area. So you can't have a discrete location. But you can click this. This will show you all your projects. And then you can actually even click, you can export it if you want to have a list. 
You know, if you're somebody who really likes to plan, you want to know what all the projects are in your town, you want to print out a list, you want to go through the list and check things off, especially if you're looking at potential projects. And then you can click on this, and then it gives you a little report on the project. So this is a statewide project. So it just tells you a little bit about it. So it's agency of ag education outreach. So you can go through here. Some of the projects will have before and after pictures. Um, it's a pretty kind of fun way to search and learn a little bit more about what's going on in your basin. All right, so there's the Watershed Projects Explorer. <laughs> So the next, the next topic, I'm not actually going to spend much time talking about. I, there are handouts in the back that are three-page summaries of this new act. It's the Clean Water Service Delivery Act. So this is really going to uh, change the way that we fund and prioritize projects. So Act 76 establishes a long-term funding source for water quality programs and amends how uh, clean water projects are implemented, administered, and funded. So this is like in progress right now. So it's happening now. What The way it's going to be is there'll be clean water service providers for a region that will say, hey, I, I'd like to be in charge of this. And then there will be watershed councils within those groups, and they will be the ones who prioritize projects and figure out which projects they want to fund. They'll also have a certain amount of money that will be set aside for them to do projects. Um, there's not a lot of details I can provide other than that. Like I said, there's a three-page summary if you want to learn a little bit more about that. And then there's this, this is an online webinar as well. If you want to come back to the presentation and listen to this, you're welcome to do that. So why we're here, we're here to talk about Basin 14. Um, Basin 14 drains 580 square miles in East Central Vermont. It covers 20 towns and three counties, Caledonia, Orange, and Windsor. So you can hear, see right here, here it is, along the Connecticut River. It includes the Ampampanusik River, the Waits River, the Wells River, the Stevens, and then four direct tributaries to the Connecticut River. The entire basin can be broken up into 13 sub-basins. So remember how I was saying you can have, you can just keep making your basin smaller and smaller depending on what point you pick. So the Stevens River is to the north, the upper wells is below that, then the weights. Then you get down to the Ampom, and then our direct drainages. So I think Norwich is uh, bloody, and then we have, in this basin here, we have uh, Lake Mori. And then this is Sutton, and I think Manchester and Peachbrook are in these areas as well. So Basin 14, like most basins in Vermont, is mostly forested when you look at the land cover. And we're really lucky in Vermont in terms of our water quality. And I would say we're really lucky in Basin 14 um, in terms of our water quality as well when you compare it to the rest of the state. So although we have a lot of forest in the headwaters and in general in the watershed, um, if you can see, when you look at this map, you can almost see the drainage networks of the rivers in red and yellow. And the red and yellow that you're seeing on the map, if you're not, and I apologize if you are colorblind, it would be diff difficult to see, but these drainage networks that you're looking at are developed lands and also agricultural lands. And, and what that tells us is that that's where it was easy to build roads and that's where the best soils are. They're along river corridors. And because of that, even though we have these forested landscapes, we have land uses that are concentrated close to our rivers. And so that's where we really have to pay attention to make sure that we are implementing the right practices and protecting our rivers from runoff and pollution from different types of land use. And then I want to give a shout out to the lakes and ponds uh, in the basin as well. The Stevens River has Harvey's Lake, is one of the largest lakes in the basin. The Wells River has Lake Groton and Kettle Pond and Ricker Pond, and I'm sure all of you have spent some time in those areas, and also Tickle Naked. The Ampapanusik has Lake Fairley, and then the Connecticut Direct Tributary Watershed.
So what was accomplished since the last plan? So this is your update. And this is something that I'm working on, so it's not, com it's not totally complete, but there's just a little bit more information I need to finish it up. The 2015 Tactical Basin Plan identified 85 actions to achieve watershed health. So that's a pretty long laundry list of actions. Um, a report card is being developed to provide progress on 85 of the actions. So, so far, 68% um, are in progress, ongoing, or complete. So some of the projects that are ongoing are things that um, are just happening continuously over time. The projects that have been completed are very discrete things like uh, dam removal, for instance, or a specific tree planting. Um, some of the projects were discontinued a very small amount, and that's just because something better came along or it just wasn't a priority anymore. 16% um, we need some more information. Most of that is going to come from our lakes and ponds program, so that will be updated. And then 14% or 12 of these actions haven't been started yet. So we're going to evaluate whether or not that will be carried on um, to the next plan. So what are these projects I keep talking about? I feel like folks in the room are actually familiar with water quality projects. I've, it's, it's really hard for me to tell when I have these meetings who I'm going to end up getting coming out. And so for some people, they're really not familiar with what water quality projects are or what they, um, what different types are maybe. So we're responsible for developing the basin plans to restore and protect the state waters. And then we have to have strategies outlined in the plans to make that happen. So we work and support many partners to implement and fulfill those actions. So the reality is, is that, yeah, the state is kind of in this position where we're responsible for writing these plans and saying, hey, everybody, this is what you should do. Um, but then we have really limited resources to actually doing the work ourselves. So we can do our best to provide technical support and, and help people in that process and then help them to identify funding. Um, but it's really the, the groups that we're working with that get the projects done. So it's really everybody else who's doing the work, uh, and the state tries the best they can to support those groups. So some projects. I also want to let everybody know that in the back, there are a bunch of different maps, and on one of those maps, there's a list of even more projects that aren't included in the presentation here that have been done. Um, we can also easily search our database to say how many projects have been completed um, since the last plan. And I think the discrete projects that have been identified have been 106 in Basin um, 14, which I think is quite, quite a lot of projects. So the gear dam removal is a natural resource project. We like to separate projects into different sectors or different types. So we can say, we've spent this much money on natural resources. We've spent this much money on road projects. You know, We've spent this much money on stormwater projects in developed areas. So we try to separate them in order to, order to say, what are we spending money on? Because the money comes from either federal or state funds. So the legislature wants to know, where are we spending money? What are we doing? Are we getting results? So gear dam removal that happened and was finished in 2017, and Ron over there <laughs> um, was, was the man in charge for this project. So this happened in West Fairley on the Ampampanusik River. The dam was built by its namesake in 1983 for hydro generation, hydropower by a retired Dartmouth professor and farmer. And it was no longer producing electricity, and his daughter lived on the land and it was also acting as a blockage to upstream movement of aquatic species like trout and downstream movement of stream materials um, because streams like to move not just water, but they like to move rocks and sticks and logs. Um, and the dam was listed as a priority for removal in the Basin 14 because it wasn't really serving a purpose anymore. And um, 17 miles of habitat was opened up to brook trout so they could um, move up and down the stream and then at other aquatic species that use that area as well. And I thought maybe we could watch a little bit of the video here that was done by Ibex. Is that he creates these projects create jobs? Is the people working on 
workers to do checks. Um, um, clean water and And something you don't see here is Ron got a photo. I think it was pretty recent after they removed the dam of a pretty large trout, New York River trout that's way up, which is just. <laughs> Was it during the room? I do have a question on my, um, okay. I think it's, it, you might have to scroll up a bit, but what's the difference between ongoing and in progress on that chart? Okay, so ongoing, I think Pam asked that, or somebody from Pam's group. Mm -hmm. So ongoing are generally like regulatory types of projects. So they might be, um, they might be outreach from the agency of ag that they're continuously doing. And so in the plan, we might have said, you know, focus education and outreach on this particular river, and that outreach will be ongoing over time. So it's not just one district discrete project and one farm or something. It's just general outreach in that area. Um, it can also be regulatory, so like the municipal roads um, general permit, for those of you who are familiar with that, where they focus on reducing runoff from dirt and paved town roads. Those are ongoing projects. So if we say focus, um, you know, reducing stormwater runoff in the town of so-and-so by this river, that might be something that they're continually going to be doing over time. They're going to continue the road erosion inventories, they're going to fix the roads and continue to do that work. And then in progress just means that it's been funded and it's happening right now, but it isn't complete. It's generally a discrete project that you can put in the complete box when it's done. So I hope I answered your question, Pam. So water quality monitoring is, is another type of project that we do in the basin. So the example that I use here is on Tickle Naked Pond, and this is located in Rygate. So two types of monitoring were conducted in this area. Um, lay monitoring data that's collected monthly in the summer by a volunteer, and then supplemental monitoring conducted by the Department of Environmental Conservation. So this monitoring was conducted to assess the effectiveness of an alum treatment that was completed in 2015 to prevent um, toxic cyanobacteria blooms. Uh, a number of water quality projects were also implemented in the watershed of Tickle Naked Pond to reduce external sources of phosphorus that were coming into the pond. And what this does is it prevents the um, the phosphorus that's in the sediment from being able to come back up in the water column, the alum treatment binds to that that phosphorus and that sediment, and so it keeps it in its place to prevent those blooms. So we have to continue to work with folks in that watershed to reduce the external sources. And so, so far, um, what we've seen, five years of data has been collected, and it indicates that the alum treatment was successful at increasing water clarity and decreasing abundance of toxic cyanobacteria blooms. There was one bloom, um, I think, two years after the treatment, after there was a large beaver dam that failed um, during a really large rain event and washed a lot of stuff into the lake. So we think that that might have been part of what happened there. But overall, the trend that we're seeing in the five years is that it's looking pretty good there. Some monitoring that happened this year as well that you can see um, in the poster in the back was completed by Greg um, at Lake Maury, and he did some tributary monitoring. Lake Maury had an alum treatment um, back in the 80s, 84, I think, um, because they were having issues also with these algae blooms. I think they had a red algae um, that 
happened after is either in the winter or um, after one of the ice outs. And so that was kind of an indicator that something was going on in that lake. And so we're, we thought, well, we're starting to see an increase in phosphorus again. So maybe we should look at the tributaries and make sure that we don't see anything um, that's really obvious, you know, that might be an external source. And so Greg has helped with the monitoring there and he's going to continue to do some follow-up monitoring for another year. But so far it looks pretty good. There's also agricultural projects. There's tons of different types of agricultural projects. This particular one is livestock exclusion. Um, so this is just fencing that they do. They give a buffer to the stream that keeps the livestock from walking and eroding the riverbank. And generally what they'll do is they will also put in some kind of watering system with the livestock exclusion as well. And so this, this particular project happened in West Fairley and it protected 24.4 acres um, from livestock um, in a waterway in that area. And then stormwater projects. So I talked a little bit about road erosion projects. This is um, an intern from the Ver Central Vermont Regional Commission working on road erosion inventories. And one of these inventories was completed for Orange. And then these pictures are examples of, I'm sure you've seen a lot of this, I, um, I mean, I have anyways driving around where you see roads that have these rock swales on the sides of them to help stabilize the ditches on the sides of roads. There's lots of different projects, but this is one that we can see more commonly. So what you're looking at are projects that were done in Newberry, Stratford, Topsom, and Orange. So, so Orange and all these towns completed the road erosion inventories, and then Newberry, Stratford, and Topsom took some grant and aid funding that was made available by the state. It's actually a pretty good funding mechanism where the state just supplies the town. The town says, check, we got some projects we can do, and then they give them the money to do them. And the results of this are hydrologically connected segments. So those are segments that water will run off, collect sediment, and then could possibly end up in a water body, a river, or a lake. These were assessed for erosion potential and then were prioritized for restoration. So what are the ones that need to be fixed the most? In Newberry, 26 um, best management practices were constructed for the West Branch of the Ampom. In Topsom, 14 were constructed to reduce runoff into Tabor Branch. And in Newberry, 18 were constructed to reduce runoff into Scott Brook. So this is something that's up and coming as uh, a storm, fairly storm water plan. So fairly received a better connections. Yep. When you're talking about runoff and the runoff to speed, um, and there's that riprap on, on an icon on the yeah. side, does that actually reduce runoff or does it channel it and have it not be used as much? So it depends on where it's located. In general, when they put in the channels, they also try to grade it so it will sheet flow and not run off in the road. So they do try to push it into that area. And then because you have the rocks and it's kind of like bumpy, it will slow down and drop more of the sediment. The other thing that it protects is that the, ro the rocks won't erode like if it's just dirt and dirt will just keep eroding down and down and down. And then you have washouts on the side of the road. So it also prevents washouts from the road. So in general, during a really big storm event, you might still get some of that dirty water into the river. It's just gonna have a lot, a lot less impact because you're not gonna have as much erosion. Yes, yeah. So the town of Fairley received a Better Connections grant um, and that will have, that ends with a draft river corridor plan that includes strategies for streetscape enhancements, transportation connectivity, economic vitality, and then also implementation and stormwater management. And through this grant, they got water quality funding that will help them do an analysis to develop three to five conceptual designs for stormwater. And I'm actually going out. I think next week um, with the consultant to look at some of these sites. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be cold um, and we'll see how much snow is melted, but we're going to look at some of these sites uh, to identify. So this isn't something that's taken place. This is just a picture of another stormwater project that somebody installed, but eventually we'll have some photos there too. And then um, last but not least, are... we have a question. Yep. Uh, can you repeat the question that's in the audience? 
Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, I should be repeating the question. So the, the question was um, sort of what is the function of the rock, the riprap rock swales on the side of the road? And the, the commenter was right in saying that the water, the dirty water that ends up sort of running into that swale ends up coming out cleaner on the other side because the sediment drops off and filters before it gets into the water source. Does that, does that work for you? Okay. Um, so education and outreach, these are, these are ones that are really hard to fund. Um, you know, a lot of our water quality funding goes to implementation, you know, like putting a project in on the ground. And this can be just as important, really just getting the word out, talking to people, teaching people um, about things that might be important for their water resource that, that, that they value. So in this case, the Lake Fairley Water Quality Committee was something that recently formed, and they reached out to DC, and we connected them with the Conservation District and our lakes program, and we all got together, and um, it's a three-town uh, group because Lake Fairley touches all those three towns. So we got together and um, talked about the rising phosphate levels that they're seeing in uh, Lake Fairley, similar to Lake Maury and other lakes that we're seeing throughout the state of Vermont. And we did a boat tour and looked at the lake and shared sort of our stories about the area. And we provided them information on what could they do, what could an action plan look like for them to start working on the problem that they're seeing. And we talked about possible tributary monitoring and then just general education and outreach to the community. And they currently have a dedicated lay monitor. So that's if, for folks who aren't familiar with that. That is a volunteer monitor who collects information for the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation in the summertime on lakes. And they have, I think, eight different sampling events or more just during those summer months. And they provide that information to us. It's been going on in some of these lakes for over 30 years. So we have some really great information. And that's how we've actually seen these increases in phosphorus over time. They also have a cyanobacteria monitor. So that's just somebody who keeps an eye out for any blooms and reports that to the state. So they're currently working on their plan and we're just providing support as they do that work. And then the E. coli and education outreach to the Ampampanusik River community. This happened, I think it was last year. Um, they received a watershed grant. So there are these grants for outreach and education. They're watershed grants. They come around once a year. So is everybody familiar with the license plates that have like a deer or peregrine falcon or catamount? So those watershed, when you buy those plates, you pay the extra money for those plates, that actually goes into funding to um, give money towards grants. And so that's where this particular project came from. Go ahead, Ron. Are the watershed grants still alive and well, or did they yeah. get nicks? They're still alive and well. Um, I'm on the kind of the sort of the review committee. So it's a combination of Fish and Wildlife and um, Vermont DEC. And uh, so there's, a, there's actually a group, a review committee that reviews them. And then we just provide feedback about projects and what we know about them. So then they pick which projects are funded. And last year, I think we got over 30 projects and we're able to fund about 20 of them. Last time I checked the website, it wasn't listed on the, you know, under all of the funding sources. Yeah, I think Chris just started working on it. So hopefully you'll see an update there. So the, the graph, you don't have to actually know what's going on in this graph. That's just to show you that the community did water quality monitoring that showed them that they have high levels of E. coli, which we know in the Ampampanusik, especially as it comes into West Fairley in the village there. So based on that information, they said, well, what, what are some things we can do right now? Um, and we thought, well, education maybe is a good way to start to get people interested. And so they did, they developed a bunch of material to bring to folks and then they had some presentations and set up some tables at some community events. And Peggy, you're saying Peggy, he came from Peggy. So Peggy was a part of that um, grant. So you might be familiar with it as well. Okay, yeah. And so I think the result of that was just more community awareness around E. coli. But I think there's still a struggle um, 
for you know how do we really deal with this because the state of Vermont doesn't necessarily have uh, rules and regulations that looks at especially if it's potentially coming from septic could be coming from um, agricultural sources it could be coming from some natural sources as well so determining where those sources are and and putting funding into that it can be challenging it's not as easy as some other pollutants what we need <laughs> Pay for the, yeah, yeah. I know. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm like, we just need to figure out where we can, like, where can we find that funding? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because all we really have now is a low interest loan, you know. So exactly, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. So everybody that's online, um, there was a comment made that what would be really helpful, especially with dealing with septic systems, is to have funding um, for folks who really can't afford even a low interest loan and need to have their systems um, replaced. And, and I think we probably all agree that that would be really great. So I'm not going to get into the details of the restoration prayers. We're not going to look at all of them, but I just wanted to give you sort of a sneak peek of um, what will be developed for the basin plan. So right here, as you see a map, these all these waters that are called out with all different colors are in our list of priority waters. So the state's required every two years to put out this list of priority waters. And then we talk about each priority water and what the issues are. And then in the plan, we have to come up with, well, how do we deal with some of these waters? And so what I'll talk to you about right now is that orange or stressed water. So those are ones that meet water quality standards, but we're a little concerned that there might be, they might be heading in the wrong direction. So we need to maybe give it a little more attention. The yellow is, is, is uh, water bodies that are not meeting our water quality standards. It doesn't mean they're not meeting all of them, but in some way they're not, and we think it might be human influence. The red is TMDL, so a TMDL is a total maximum daily load. Uh, it's a calculation of the maximum amount of a pollutant that a water body can take without it um, failing water quality standards. And in general, TMDLs are just plans written to deal with the water quality problem. So those that have TMDLs mean there are plans written around those water bodies to help deal with the issues. Black are flow altered water. So that's generally where there's going to be a lack of flow, um, a water level or flow fluctuations or modified hydrology um, that arises from human activity and may have impacts to biota and water quality. And then the green is our waters that are altered by exotics. So things like milfoil. And then this is the list. So if you're interested and you want to see this, you know, obviously before the plan comes out, you can look at the list of waters online, or you can come to this list and get a little bit more information. Um, th these right here, there's a number in here that are from mine drainage, and there are a few that have actually had some recent work done. So in the plan, there'll be updates on those sites. They're generally um, dealt with through the EPA and our hazardous waste uh, division and these take long periods of time and lots of money. What are, what are the items that are starred? So the ones that are starred are ones that I've been working on with partners more recently. So there's just been kind of action associated with those. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are blue are things that stuff has been happening. So in here, Lake Maury and Lake Fairley, they both have programs to deal with Eurasian water milfoil. And then this is Copperus Brook and Lord Brook, where they've actually done remediation in both Elizabeth Mine and the South Cut and the South Mine as well. And there's, there'll be more detail in the plan about those if you're interested in them. And then this, because Basin 14 is such a, I, I know you look at that first map and it looks like, oh my God, there's so much stuff going on. But if you read through the list, um, some of the things are things that maybe we don't have a lot of control over and that there's already regulation to deal with, especially the acid um, stressed waters. But the map you're looking at here is, are all the waters that meet a higher um, standard for water quality? So in general, all the waters of the state need to be what we call B2. They need to meet our water quality standards. 
And so the, the water bodies you're looking at here are B1 or A1. And so the way I look at this type of, I mean, it's very bureaucratic the way that it's all laid out. Um, the way I look at it is that a B1 is like, is kind of like your honor student, right? And then an A1 is kind of like your A plus 4.0 student. And then the B2 waters, which we want every water to meet, is like your good B student. They're doing well, right? And then the waters that are not meeting are the ones that are failing. So they're kind of like your D and F students. Maybe D is like our stressed waters. So let's just give you a better idea. So all these supported by monitoring data from the Department of Environmental Conservation and Fish and Wildlife are meeting criteria for fisheries and aquatic biota for being high quality waters. So there's a lot of different ways we can go about to protect these. Um, so if these are in your town and you're interested in saying, I want to make sure that we're protecting these in my town, then let's talk. Let's see what kind of strategies we can develop to protect these. So there's a lot of them. So what's the timeline for the plan? Right now we got the kickoff meeting in November. Uh, there'll be a first draft internal review. So that's when I put together a draft and send it out to um, all the internal staff that I work with that provides me the information. And then the regional planning commissions also get a copy. So they review that with their boards. Um, so I'd recommend if you're interested in being able to have a look at that to contact your regional planning commissions. They also have clean water action committees as well because um, we want to be able to get, you know, comments back from folks. So hopefully we can have some meetings around that. The final draft should be complete in March 2020. Then I'll have public meetings in May, so similar to this, but it'll be going over some of the priorities of the plan. And then in June 2020, the plan should be complete. And then we can, you know, keep continuing the efforts that we're focused on. So how can you become involved? Uh, attend your tactical basin plan meetings, learn who your local watershed partners are. Um, a lot of them are in this room right now. Um, you know, find out how is your town improving water quality. Uh, familiarize yourself with the most recent tactical basin plan for your town and connect with watershed partners in your town and how you can help, you know, provide support to them if they're doing the work. And it can be as simple as just doing things on your property and wanting to learn what can I do on my property to make sure I'm a good steward to water quality. You don't have to be spending, you know, hours and hours of volunteer time to do this. If no watershed groups exist in your area, you can reach out to me or the regional planning commissions of your conservation district. And so here's all the contact info for your planners. And then I put together, this is something that if folks are interested, you know, with all that free time you have, um, you can watch some of these videos. This is a video that talks about lake shoreland bioengineering. It's a really cool video. It shows you some work that they've done on shorelands where they've had erosion problems. Um, this video is about restoring wetlands. And I think most of these restorations that happen in the Champlain Valley where you have these really large wetland areas along the lake. This is a really neat video about river management. So what the, the best techniques are for river management in your town, in, in your community. This is a video about the Otter Creek and how the floodplains and the natural infrastructure in that area help to protect the town of Middlebury. And this is one I find really interesting too, is about the town of Brandon and some work that they did in their town um, to deal with water quality issues. So it gives you an idea of like, how can towns be involved? What is work that towns can do? Or what can local communities, community partners do in your town? And it really involves a bunch of different people, private landowners, the local groups, the municipalities, and um, the basin planners. If you're interested in water quality information, you want to know, like, has anybody sampled my stream that I live next to? What is that water quality data? There's the Vermont Integrated Watershed Information System. So you can check that out and get some water quality monitoring data. If you have trouble using any of these, there's a user guide to it that you can look at. Um, you can also talk to me. If this is something you're really interested in, we can sit down and go over this stuff. There's also the cyanobacteria tracker. So that's I was saying that there's people who monitor this stuff. This is where they report it to, and it's mapped. And then there's this great booklet, Living in Harmony with Streams, that was updated in 2016 by Watersheds United. 
And then I have a list of partners for Basin 14. If you want to get in touch with anybody or interested in knowing who those partners are, I don't expect you to be able to read this from where you're sitting. Um, and you can share your recommendations for the Basin 14 plan using the survey. So you can go, I have the survey link on the agenda. So if you grab an agenda, there's a survey link there. There's also, if you have, um, if you use iPhone, you can scan the code there and it'll take you to the survey as well. Um, you can go to this presentation and get the link there. So I, anytime you can give your comments or recommendations in the plan. The only thing I would say is that if you have a, a discharge, like, you know, a direct discharge of a pollutant that you see going into the waters, you don't want to, you know, send it through here. You want to contact the environmental enforcement division so they can go out right away and look at that. So this is more like long-term issues that we are looking for. Um, and then if you're looking at this online, you don't see your organization on the list and you want it to be added because you work with us on the plans, I can add it. So we have the Connecticut River Conservancy, the Caledonia Natural Resources Conservation District, uh, the Northeastern Vermont Development Association, Two Rivers Out of Coichi Regional Planning Commission, the Connecticut River Joint Commission, the Upper Valley Subcommittee, the White River Natural Resources Conservation District, the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, Vermont River Conservancy, the Connecticut River Paddlers Trail. So we do focus on some recreation recommendations in the plans as well. Um, the Connecticut River Farmers Watershed Alliance, the Watersheds United Vermont, and the Lake Maury Commission. So please, um, you know, if your group's interested in working with us or has worked with us in the past, let us know so we can add your name to the list. So that's it. Thanks for hanging on <laughs> through that. I appreciate it. Um, and so now's the time for people to ask questions and um, offer their comments or recommendations for the plan. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so anybody, if you could say your name too. The, and there's a microphone if you could, thank you. Is the slide presentation available online? Yes, I'm going to make the slide. The question was, is the slide presentation available online? I'm going to load it up tomorrow morning, and I'll have the presentation, so you can just look at that on its own. And I'll also have the webinar if you want to listen to me blab on for another hour. <laughs> So Danielle, the end result of the basin plan will be a list of priority projects, correct? Yes. Will those priority projects be tied to available state funding sources, or will it just be a priority projects list that may or may not be eligible for state funding? OK. So the question was, um, will the basin plan have a list of projects for implementation, which is yes. And will that list be tied to state funding as well? Um, so what we've been doing is that we'll put the list together and then we'll try to figure out where we think funding can be gotten for those particular projects and then put that funding in to the table. So that's how we're going to do that. The reason I ask is that landscape of funding is changing dramatically. Mm -hmm. Especially through Act 76, yeah. you know. So I think we'll probably leave things to clean water funding is probably how we'll do any state funding. I think, I'm not sure if VTRANS funding and things like that will change or Agency of Ag funding will change. So those may be staying the same. Any other questions, comments? Jim Bolger from Tops. I've been interested uh, definitely interested in conservation and clean water but i'm also concerned about landowners that have lands along the rivers of the floodplains uh, especially agricultural or forest lands that uh, need these setbacks mm -hmm. uh, the tax bill still comes and it's a full tax it mm -hmm. isn't prorated because you can no longer use this land. Is there going to be any compensation for these landowners that now can no longer use that portion of their lands? Yeah, so the question was, um, 
their support for water quality practices that protect surface waters. But there's a question that for people who own land along these rivers, if they're asked to have setbacks or want to do those setbacks, they still get taxed the same. So will there be any incentives that are offered to these landowners? Um, so there, there's actually some incentive talk going on around agricultural lands. There's a there's like a group that's formed. It's in the Lake, Champ Lake Champlain Basin. Um, so they're talking about right now, what could that look like? You know, what what is the funding model? Um, and how would we compensate people? But this it was really focused on ag. I could see that it could translate into anybody who would be protecting surface waters. I think that I don't know of like any really good examples outside of Vermont even where that's been successful um, or where people have come up with good enough ideas that would support that. But I'm in, I'm in complete agreement with you that if you're providing a, you are providing an ecosystem service that has value um, by protecting those resources anywhere in the, in the watershed where you're doing good work. Um, and you should be, it would be great to be compensated, especially, you know, and there actually has been talk in some towns, I was talking with the Regional Planning Commission um, in the Lamoille County, and they were actually talking about, it was one of the towns was saying how they would really like to be able to provide one of the towns higher up in the watershed um, with some kind of compensation because they know that what this town does higher up in the watershed affects them because they're really close to the river and they get flooded out a lot. And so they even want it there, you know, they just don't know how. Um, so there has been some talk, there's some work, there is a work group that's formed around it for ag lands, but that's about as far as it's gone. But I think it's a really important conversation. It's a hard sell because in this basin, we have very narrow valleys. Mm -hmm. and that's where the agriculture Mm -hmm. A lot of screens coming in. Yeah. But yeah. there are some programs. You've got the CREC program that does pay landowners for giving up yes. that property. Yes. You've got the river corridor easements. I mean, we've done some projects with some folks that ended up making, you know, $25,000 when they took that land out of production. And that's basically to compensate them for that lost income. Yeah, that's a good point. So Ron from the River Connecticut River Conservancy was saying how we do have programs like the conservation or conservation reserve easement program, um, and then the river corridor easements as well. Some of these small farms, you give that up and you don't have your property. Yeah, small. yeah, it's it's true, and that's another thing that they have been discussing in the Champlain Basin is is even farm buyouts, which I think can be really, really hard topic, I think, to talk about. Um, that's one of the reasons why it's kind of nice not to be in those, in that basin right close to the lake, because there's a lot of, there's just, it's a very difficult thing to, to figure out what the solutions are and everybody comes out feeling good about it. Michael Thomas, remember um, a comment on that is, if you're protecting your land by stabilizing your stream bank, aren't you protecting the rest of your land for the future? Isn't that compensation there? If your stream keeps eroding back as streams longer, then you do some planning or other type of things, keep your cattle off of the bank and things like that, and you're protecting the rest of your land yeah. for the future. So isn't that, by doing that work, aren't you compensating yourself in a way for your future, yeah, you're, not just instantly financially. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I think, I would say at least from my perspective, what we run into is it's really hard to make that argument with people. Yeah, I mean, you're right, you're absolutely right. And in many cases, it can be a real benefit to doing that for people. Like they will save their land from eroding, yeah, into the river, um, but yeah, it's hard to, it's hard for people to understand that sometimes. That's why sometimes the education, the outreach, take doing farm tours, you know, going to farms where they have done it and it's benefited them and showing other farmers, um, you know, or private, even private landowners 
that's where you can convince people. But just like having somebody stand up from the state and say, this is what you should do. You know, this is what we we know based on science is the most important thing we could be doing. It's as an example, um, I don't know if they get funding to help them do it or compensation for it. The Klopp's farm up in the Groton, uh, in Mosler Valley up in Groton, right in Boy. Their stream meanders quite a bit through the meadows. And they've done planting up there the last couple of years, and that should give them a solid farm base for the rest of his land. I believe they actually have an easement that might have been funded through VHCB because I because the name sounds familiar like I've seen it on the project list so yeah yeah so they've done the easement and they did the planting yeah we obviously don't have the money to you know fund everybody to do the easements so and if I could just do a plug that's the Connecticut River farmers Connecticut River Watershed Farmers Alliance is such a long name. <laughs> <laughs> and Jennifer can tell you more about that, but that's a great way for local farmers to get involved in these issues and figure out yeah. if they're interested how to get some of those programs and some of those money. Because you know, I get, what, 20 farmers in a room for a meeting or more. Yeah, and we're going to have a meeting with them next week on, on monday yep. we're going to have a, a sort of farm specific meeting on on vacant planning um and yeah and that's where this link I, you know it's good that all of us are in a room together but that's where this link uh for you know us to know about the other conservation groups that are out there that can that can um, help people with that initial you know the, the funding needs for that kind of implementation you know it's one thing to say protect your street banks but to actually get them over that hurdle is something that, you know, hurts. Um, especially the conservation districts, we can kind of link to all those different funding sources at the state and federal level. Yeah, so for folks online, Ron made the comment that um, the Connecticut River Farmers Watershed Alliance is a good group for farmers to connect to, to learn what um, opportunities there are. And Jennifer just reinforced that, you know, saying that there's some hurdles to getting folks interested in it, but it's a good group for for people to be able to have those conversations. Um, and then Frank had a question, uh, but do they give tax break to individual landowners river corridor easements? And so in terms of the river corridor easements, I don't believe there's any tax break. You're, you're given a, a one-time um, payment for that. I'm not sure there might be some of the farm programs. Um, there may be some that pay over a number of years, but I don't think it's forever. Um, and then, you know, it's also up to towns. Obviously, if the town <laughs> happens to have a lot of funding and they want to do that, um, people are welcome to ask. I used to do wetlands work, and I did work with some folks who had pretty significant wetlands on their property, and I provided them letters saying they had significant wetlands, they can't develop in those areas, and then they provided those letters to the town and asked for a lower tax rate, and it actually worked. Um, but, you know, when people are already needing all the money that's coming in for the taxes, that might be a little bit harder for folks to take. Any other questions? I have a comment. Um, one of, uh, during the first round of the Basin 14, one of the meetings we had in Newberry that attracted the most outreach to most people is that I think Ron might have been involved with that. Is um, we had a meeting inviting landowners who had property on rivers and streams in lakes to come and find out what type of resources, not just farmers, but everybody, yeah. what type of resources were available for them and if they could do projects on their land. And we probably had close to 30 people at that meeting, which was one of our larger public turnouts. So okay. I'd like to see that type of public involvement um, included in future planning and the way to reach out and get the real citizens involved. Yeah, yeah, I'm open to it. Any ideas that people have that, you know, I mean, I think that's such a great idea. Saying, we, hey, we have, you want to learn about some resources, you know, that you can use for your land? I can see that that would be something that would bring folks out. 
Am I correct in thinking that wetlands are now counted, the acreage of wetlands are now counted in the current use program? That not just like forested or farmland, but wetlands are now oh, considered I don't, a, another resource that... I don't know. I think so. Okay. Yeah, let's okay. check up on that. I'd like somebody to correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, that would be good for us to check up on and um, to include in the plan if there's been that change as well. And the question was, if I don't know if folks heard online, is that in the current use that there's been an update that wetlands are now included in the land area calculations. I don't know. Does anybody here know? Okay. Yeah, let's let's look that up. I know. All right. Any other questions or comments? Oh, uh, there's one on. Uh, do they give tax? I already. Yeah. Oh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. I have another question. If yeah. I uh, through Newberry, Brigate, and Rotten, as a uh, result of this program, uh, a lot of the towns took advantage of the. Uh, Bridge and culvert surveys yep. and did upgrade works and use that in their planning for uh, future work on the roads. Is there a, a way or an ongoing process to track that um, so as they so that they can see the benefits of the work that was done so they know how important it is to move forward and that the, this is a continuing program that they can get on? Um, Towns change, select boards change, mm -hmm. road commissioners change, and some of the stuff would be good to reinforce with them as roads, washouts, or as your map pointed out earlier, all by streams, mm -hmm. that's where they were built. And, and that's a big source of pollution and sediment into the system. Yeah. So it'd be nice to reinforce the positive um, and get out the words of the people of what was done with those programs in the town and how it benefited years later yeah um so the question was is, is there a way to get out the word to towns that have taken advantage of you know bridge and culvert inventories and have done these upgrades and replacements to show what the benefits have been from them participating in that and jess do you have any idea because the regional planning commissions are generally are the ones who work with the towns on helping get those inventories done. Fish and Wildlife is also another partner who's done a lot of work on the stream crossings and is kind of moving towards, I think, having more information associated with that. But I didn't know if maybe after some of these flooding and storm events, like maybe this is a, an action or a strategy we could put in the plan is to try to record where we see you know, oh, we did these replacements and now look what's happening. You know, we're not getting as much of the road washouts and then using that information then to share that with other towns to maybe get them to continue doing the work. Yeah, so I mean, even going off of what Danielle was saying that when we do use like the grants and aid funding um, to do the inventories and as well as implement some of those uh, the ditching projects, the covert projects, um, we do try when we do have flooding events and things like that to go back out, take pictures and see how they're standing up. Um, we obviously, we can't always get out to all of those projects, but um, when we can, we do try to get out to document that. Um, and that's something that can certainly be shared. I think that would be a great way to, you know, just be showing the communities that, you know, the dollars that you're spending on this is paying off. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's, uh, yeah, I think that would be a great action to maybe if there's a, way that even if we can't get out there to do that, if you know there's other members of the community that are willing to go out there and we can let them know where these projects have been implemented and see. And even putting putting road. together the information, like the river and roads training is another way that they work with towns to with road foremen and with select boards it's generally people who are doing the work on the roads that they have these trainings for um, and they will go and kind of show them you know the whole process the river process how it works how to resize culverts what the benefits are and then they have a whole field day where they go out on site and they look at all different projects together so i would say that that's one way and then to be able to provide that information um back to like just that you've collected back to the river roads training program to be able to have that info to have in their presentations so that that's one way that it happens 
Um, I have a, a, a answer to the question of current use. I, at least I think it's an answer. I'm, I'm hoping it's the most updated answer. But um, as far as wetlands, um, wetlands can be included in, in uh, conservation land, which is a type of eligibility under the scope of forest land. Um, so, but for uh, forest land current use, um, it, there's uh, you have to have a minimum of 25 contigu contiguous acres, but only 80% of that needs to be forest land. So there could be, um, you know, wetlands included in that um, if you're if you're eligible under forest land. Okay. All right. Anything else? And remember, if you have recommendations, um, you can come back. Like I said, if you Google Basin 14 Vermont and you go to the website, I'll have the presentation up. I'll have the link to the survey up. Um, please feel free to share that information with anybody that you know that's interested in providing some feedback, you know, that has maybe some good ideas or wants to become involved in some way. Um, you sh share as much as you want. And then, like I said, we work with the regional planning commissions and the conservation districts. So any groups that they work with, we try to disseminate that information to them as well. So when we have these meetings, we send this stuff out to all the towns. And so just depending on who the folks are in your town, sometimes that information will get out to folks. Sometimes it may not. Um, we've tried lift serves. I don't know if anybody has any other recommendations for places that we could, any lift serves or ways to get the information out that you think would the conservation commission I, I would say okay so maybe if i can get a list of the vermont conservation commissions and get like a group uh, actually do, do you know if all the con so that the association of vermont conservation commissions that google group is everybody on that do we know Okay. All right. All right. So I should be able to use that. And then using the conservation Google groups too, as well, should be a good way. Okay. Directly, what's as a conservation commission member in the town of Newberry, um, what should we look, what should we be looking forward to coming down? What are some of the next steps or how can we get more involved? Um, you have your project map up there that we mm -hmm. can go and check out. But what are some of the things we could be expecting that will get us excited how to contact you? Okay. Um, I think what we should do is we should meet up. So I can look in Newberry and see, you know, what are the focus areas. I think, you know, you know the Wells River would be one of them. Um, and to try to come up with, okay, well, what do we want to do? What do we want the focus to be in Newberry? What are people excited about doing? Um, because I feel like there is a prioritization saying, you know, we feel like these are the top things, but if people are willing and interested in working on things, like why not focus on the things that they're, they really want to, to work on? Because the reality is, is that that's where we're going to get stuff done. Um, so I think that we should, we should meet up. Um, I think probably a good time would be, I should have the draft of that plan done in January. So maybe after the draft of the plan, we can get together in January or February and, and come up with maybe some ideas of what we could do. The thought is when the first plan came out, we were concentrating on the Wells River Basin in the heart of Newburgh, like the Halls Pond drainage yeah. and all the other small streams were really not in that. So we haven't done as much work. And Newburgh's west with a lot of small ponds that drained in place. We haven't really done that much work in that section. Okay. And it would also be, um, why I'm thinking about it, I'm glad it on here, um, to keep coordinated, like we did the first round, with the other, the Stevens, the Waits, and the Ampoff and Newsom, okay. and the Wells, and to keep these groups coordinated. So if there is a common issue, like we did in the past, we could have a group meeting between the different areas and save everybody time. Okay. Yeah, let's have that be a strategy in the plan to, to get together and kind of rehash and see where we want to go in the future. Okay, thanks. All right, so it sounds like Pam said she'd share in her newsletter. I like the listservs that you provided the info to. I got a lot of feedback there. Um, so I guess... I mean, we have five more minutes if anybody has any other questions. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> this is actually a very affordable uh, venue. I just want to let people know if you ever want to hold an event here, considering this is state funding that pays for these, we don't really have much available. So it was kind of nice to be able to have a spot like this. Um, not that I don't love the libraries and the fire stations and the town halls too. All right, great. Well, thanks uh, every. Yep. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I just like to uh, put out there that uh, on Monday the 18th we will have, like I mentioned before, the um, sort of an agriculture work group um, for landowners um, at the Bradford Firehouse at 1 p.m. So if you know any landowners that might want learn about this, but um, just from kind of a landowner agriculture perspective and can lend their voice, uh, please send them to that. And you can reach out to me um, to get the specifics. It's also on our Facebook page as an event. And I have a, I have a comment I, I wanted to pull up as well. So. Okay. And if everybody, please, before you leave the sign-in sheet, that also helps us to prove that we bought food and needed a room for the people that came. <laughs> So please do sign that. And there's plenty of food and seltzer and cider left over. Like, take it home with you. Bring it to your significant other. They'll thank you, right? <laughs> or your dog. Maybe they like apples. About taking gravel out of the river. Uh, how much does it cost in road flooding costs and lost land to not allow this? Um, how many homes will be sacrificed? How many fish will die due to no deep, cool waters to hide in? Let's take the gravel out of the rivers. It's the comment. Yeah, so um, this is a really interesting one. I would say that what science tells us, uh, numerous studies over and over and over again, that taking gravel out of rivers is not a good idea that it doesn't provide the benefits that we think it does maybe short term but that area is just going to fill right back in with sediment um, it is not the type of habitat that fish want to be living in fish want to be in natural pools that are formed because there's woody debris in their streams they don't want to be in streams that have no cover and protection for them and that's what streams that have gravel taken out of them uh, provide for fish in those communities. The other thing is, is if you make those deeper streams, you're really impacting your communities um, downstream from you because they're the ones who are going to get hit really hard um, with that flood water. So while you may be protecting yourself in the short term, um, in the long term you're really costing yourself, you're costing other people, you're impacting wildlife habitat, and there's tons of science that, that shows that this is just the way it is. But I understand that when you do it, and you do it quick, and it seems short term that, hey, there's a benefit here. But um, it's just been proven that the benefit is not worth the cost in the long run. All righty. All right, folks. School's out, right? <laughs> Yes, I think I think I think there's something here that tells you like how they want it set up.